Welcome to this presentation titled Applications of Pulsed Electromagnetic Field Therapy in Small Animals to be presented by Dr. Deirdre Caramlanti and sponsored by Assisi Animal Health. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, I am going to talk about targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. The loop delivers weak pulsing microcurrents to the tissue using a pulsed electromagnetic field. These currents, which cannot be felt, modulate the body's response to injury and trauma. We have many published peer review studies showing that post-traumatic and chronic pain and inflammation are reduced significantly faster with the loop. Many of these studies also show that the loop significantly accelerates healing of acute and chronic wounds. The human version of the loop is cleared by the FDA for reduction of pain and edema and is now a standard part of the surgeon's armamentarium to manage postoperative pain and inflammation. The lovely thing is the loop is compatible with other physical modalities such as laser therapy, which are commonly used in veterinary practice today. It's battery operated and portable, so it can be sent home with a client to continue the healing and the relationship at home. This diagram, although it looks busy, illustrates the primary mode of action of the loop. Activation of the intracellular calcium buffer calmodulin is accelerated, which instantaneously enhances calmodulin dependent, i.e. the anti-inflammatory nitric oxide production. This in turn immediately enhances blood and lymph flow and reduces inflammatory cytokine production, which rapidly decreases pain and edema. Enhanced nitric oxide signaling also accelerates growth factor production, which increases healthy angiogenesis and tissue repair. If we look here at this graph, it shows that nitric oxide is involved in the inflammatory, proliferative, and regeneration stages of wound repair. This shows immediately on the left that a large quantity of nitric oxide is produced in the inflammatory stage. Upon injury, macrophages and neutrophils produce IL-1 beta, which will upregulate I-NOS, or inducible nitric oxide synthase. And this causes the body to produce large amounts of nitric oxide. And this will unnecessarily prolong the inflammatory stage of repair. Also, upon injury, intracellular calcium increases and is immediately captured by calmodulin. This is a good reaction, a healthy reaction, that activates CNOS, or the constitutive NOS, which produces short bursts of nitric oxide to be produced. This is the pathway that can be enhanced by the loop. These calmodulin-dependent transient bursts of NO will downregulate the inducible NOS, the pro-inflammatory version, via a negative feedback mechanism. And this is why the loop is especially effective at this stage, because it reduces excessive pro-inflammatory nitric oxide and will decrease the duration of the inflammatory phase. This will lead to accelerated healing because growth factor production is enhanced. We have a few slides to discuss the science in detail. Upon injury, intracellular calcium increases and is immediately captured by calmodulin, which is then activated. The loop enhances this initial response, which in turn increases nitric oxide synthase activation, which produces increased bursts of nitric oxide, which I discussed before. This, in turn, enhances cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP. We all remember these from our extensive education. Increased cyclic GMP from the loop causes immediate enhancement of blood and lymph flow, which reduces inflammation more rapidly. Enhanced cyclic GMP also modulates cytokines and growth factors, which also reduce inflammation, enhance healthy angiogenesis and tissue repair. Increased cyclic AMP from the loop accelerates cell differentiation and matrix formation, thereby enhancing all the good benefits of tissue repair. This slide summarizes the basic science behind the development of the radio frequency that targeted PEMF signal delivered by the ACC loop. The identified target is the calcium calmodulin binding the kinetic and electrical properties of which enable the specific loop signal parameters to be chosen. Once the calcium calmodulin target receives the loop signal, nitric oxide signaling is instantaneously enhanced. The PEMF signal was chosen to target calcium calmodulin binding specifically, thus the loop signal is a targeted P 
PEMF signal. Other PEMF devices deliver signals that can also modulate the calcium calmodulin pathway. However, they are not configured specifically to target this pathway 100%. Therefore, only a portion of their induced electric field will be applied to this pathway. Definition, lossy means a portion of the induced electric field is lost in other pathways. This demonstrates why the ACC's T-targeted PEMF is the most effective to deliver relief from pain and inflammation. So what does this mean? We have taken a couple of the other signals and um, broken them down and figured out exactly where their target is going. Our targeted PEMF delivers virtually 100% of its PEMF dose to enhance the nitric oxide pathway and reduce pain more efficiently. This bar graph compares some of the other devices currently on the market. The comparison is on the basis of how much of the total signal is actually del delivered to the calcium calmodulin pathway. As may be seen, all other devices deliver only a portion of their signal to this pathway, and thus would be expected to be less efficient for pain relief, relief from edema, et cetera. These are two peer-reviewed level one randomized studies on the use of PMF to reduce postoperative pain after breast augmentation. The HEDEN study uses soft pulse, which is actually the name for the FDA cleared human version of the loop. And the raw study used device two, which is also a pulse radio frequency signal. Comparison of the results show that the soft pulse, the loop, reduced post-op pain more than twofold faster than that produced by device two. Strong evidence that the PEMF dose delivered by device two was substantially smaller than delivered by the soft pulse or our signal. Peer-reviewed blinded studies in animals clearly show that the loop PMF signal accelerates cutaneous wound healing and tendon repair by reducing pro-inflammatory cytokines and increased growth factor production. In both studies, the one on the left and the right, tensile strength measurements provided objective evidence that the loop accelerated healing by 59% and 69% better than shams. This is consistent with modulation of IL-1 beta this is actually the in situ form delivered by the ACC loop. The loop generates a two millisecond burst of 27.12 megahertz, which is FCC regulated short wave radio signal, which repeats at two bursts per second. The induced magnetic field is four microtesla, for which the induced electric field is about five volts per meter. A measure of peak power in situ or SAR, or a specific absorption rate, shows that the loop signal is non-thermal, which we love. Its low amplitude also means that it cannot be perceived by the patient. However, some warmth may, may be experienced as, as a result of increased blood flow from PEMF. I have used this myself, and I have experienced this myself. This diagram represents the approximate magnetic field distribution as it propagates from the plane of the coil in both directions. The magnetic field, which is the treatment field, penetrates without loss through hard and soft tissue, decreases rapidly with distance. This causes the effective treatment volume to decrease with distance from the plane of the coil. Thus, if you imagine a football in the middle of the loop, this would demonstrate your targeted field of treatment. We have two current versions of the ACC loop, the ACC loop 150 and the ACC loop automatic. The ACC loop 150 is a manual turn on. You turn on the button and the generator, the battery pack at the bottom flashes green and the treatment cycle lasts for 15 minutes. When it's done, it shuts itself off. You can use this up to every two hours per day and will guarantee at least a minimum of 150 treatments. Some go longer as long as the loop is well cared for and not placed in direct sunlight. Some clients are reporting 200 and up to 250 treatments per loop. The loop on the right, the automatic, is an automated version. When you turn on the power, it will turn itself off and on every two hours for the 15-minute treatment cycle. This will work for at least 100 treatments and is excellent in acute trauma and post-operative care situations. This 
slide reviews the early evidence that the targeted PMF signal actually targets the calcium calmodulin pathway, thereby enhancing the activity of myosin light chain kinase. This in turn catalyzes myosin light chain phosphorylation, which is related to the smooth muscle contraction and relaxation modulating blood flow, which we really want. This study also showed that the calcium calmodulin binding kinetics were increased about twofold, which explains the increase in calmodulin activation. This study shows that when cells are challenged with a lipopolysaccharide to cause inflammation, TPMF immediately enhances nitric oxide production. It is important to note that targeted PMF had no effect if they were not challenged, which explains why there are no adverse or side effects have ever been reported with targeted PEMF therapy. This slide confirms that the calcium calmodulin is a targeted PEMF target pathway. If we block calmodulin from binding to and activating its enzyme target, it also blocks a PEMF effect and this provides strong evidence that the PEMF modulates the entire calcium calmodulin pathway. The targeted PEMF effect on both nitric oxide and cyclic GMP production was blocked by using calmodulin antagonists. This study shows that the targeted PMF, the gray bar on the right, downregulates IL-1 beta, which is consistent with the targeted PMF effect on nitric oxide signaling. In this study, mononuclear cells were subject to a heat shock challenge. During a temperature shock challenge, targeted PMF downregulates the inflammatory IL-1 beta, demonstrated by the first bar, and upregulates IL-5, 6, and 10, which are anti-inflammatory, again consistent with a targeted PMF effect on nitric oxide signaling. This in vivo study shows that targeted PMF significantly increased angiogenesis, and that's healthy angiogenesis, in a rat heart which was thermally injured. Overall, targeted PMF doubled the number of new blood vessels in 21 days. The results here were shown were obtained by feeding the rat's L-name, a general nitric oxide synthase inhibitor. As may be seen, the targeted PMF effect on angiogenesis was blocked. Again, strong support for the mechanism of action of targeted PEMF. This experiment created traumatic brain injury in rats. Without PEMF, as we can see, the blue graph, IL-1B is quite elevated. With PEMF, the red bar, the IL-1 beta levels are quite reduced. This is a very good example of a controlled animal experiment. You have intact, you have your controlled, and you have your sham and your active. This is a demonstration of a mouse stroke model in which a stroke was produced by occluding the distal middle cerebral artery of a mouse brain. Recovery from this involves an array of cytokines and chemokines, as you can see here, are modulated in the correct direction by targeted PMF. The important clinical events result in a smaller infarct size with targeted PMF, and this is really important in our healing and animals healing. These graphs are pretty exciting as they show that targeted pulse electromagnetic therapy has a known effect on blood flow via nitric oxide cyclic GMP signaling. On the left, targeted PMF increases capillary blood flow in an anesthetized rat brain. You can see by the bubbles at the two hour time point increased. Alternatively, when you block it with a CNOS inhibitor as we discussed before, L-name, it actually blocked the targeted PMF effect and those levels did not rise. These two, studies on the, these two studies, the left on full thickness cutaneous wounds and on the right transected Achilles tendons in rats, targeted PMF was applied. In both instances, the targeted PMF repair tissues had stronger tensile strength 
than sham treatments. Three weeks later measured at close to 60 and 70% stronger than the sham models. This slide demonstrates in post-operative breast surgery, there are more inflammatory markers in the sham treated women. So there are two studies. The one on the left is just the breast reduction. The one on the right is the exudate analysis on breast reconstruction plus tram flap, the abdominal muscular flap closure. When treating with targeted PMF, it downregulated IL-1 beta in both instances. This slide shows in these same two studies, by using targeted PMF, their pain levels based on visual analog scores are very decreased. Same with women on the right who had additional surgery, the tram flap. Again, same population of women, breast reduction and tram flap on the right, shows that using targeted PMF, less exudate, less edema is produced in both procedures as measured by wound exudate volume. And in humans, they use pill counts, so Percocet equivalents of pain control. Women in both studies required less narcotics as measured by a pill count, and actually by a pretty good amount in both. Shifting away from soft tissue surgery uh, at the Henry Ford Clinic, they performed a chronic osteoarthritis study. Using the loop, there was a 60% reduction of pain within the first three days, which is pretty cool. That's shown by the bold line on the bottom. And this was supposed to be a crossover study, but we heard that many of the patients refused to actually cross over because they were so happy with the pain relief, they knew they had the active model. So where are we going and what are we doing? This list includes early work done in canines showing where the CC loop has had success in treating different problems. Pain, musculoskeletal, neurologic, which is fabulous, wounds, chronic or acute, other. Any instance where there is inflammation, the loop should be applied. This list highlights conditions in felines and equines where we have had success treating different diagnoses. Felines, we all know the frustration now that we actually have a couple of good non-steroidals that are um, approved here. It's very difficult sometimes for owners to treat their cats, including myself. Um, and this is a very simple solution since the loop can penetrate up to four to five inches through soft and hard tissue, which includes blankets, bedding, couch padding, um, and their own bodies, we can slip the loop into a cat bed and they won't even know that they're being treated. We've had some successful stories about owners being able to wean their cats off of steroids with gingivostomatitis. In equines, they're a little bit bigger, so sometimes our field is challenged by just depth of perception, but we've had some great success with laminitis, wobblers, and definitely a lot of wounds in equine distal extremities. This shows the financial aspect of the loop. Many times when I lecture to populations, I always do a poll of who is actually using laser therapy because I think they've done a fabulous job with marketing and the studies are coming around to really support its benefit um, medically. But they always, always will impress upon the veterinarian the financial aspect because that's important when you're spending several thousand dollars on a piece of equipment. The beauty of the loop is that if you buy them, depending on how many you buy, from $119 to $149 a piece, the suggested retail value is $249 each. This will bring the cost of treatment to as low as $1.50 per treatment to the owner. Alternatively, many veterinarians rent the loop out to patients to try in non-acute situations. And you can start with a Q12 hour regimen, Q8, Q6 hour regimen, just to see if they get a benefit before they spend the $249. So let's move on to some case studies. The first, I'm just going to show one picture from the human aspect. 
which highlights a published study on human clinical example of how the targeted PMF healed a failed breast reconstruction after nine weeks. Obviously on the left, the pretreatment, and on the right, nine weeks, the only treatment the woman had was targeted PMF therapy twice a day. Moving on to wounds in our field, the first case presentation is on Petey the dog, who presented, of course, on emergency with a wound on the lateral side of his left forefoot that extended from the carpus down to the digit. It was deep enough, and you can see here, to expose an extensor tendon to his metacarpals. Dead tissue was debrided, the wound was cleaned and bandaged, the bandage was changed daily, and laser therapy, of course, because they had it, was used conjunctively. At, by 10 days, the wound was contracting nicely and had significantly less separation from it. Therefore, bandage changes occurred less frequently because we know that bandage material adds up over time. And so then the opportunity to use laser therapy was also decreased. The beauty of the Assisi loop is that it can be used through bandages. The second photo shows that within five weeks, the edges of the wound have completely epithelialized. The treating vet, and again, it's not a scientific study, felt that the loop accelerated the rate of healing by 30%. Why? He lived in an area that had many of these stray dogs that were kind of um, given up, showed up, up at his practice with emergencies, and he would take them, rehab them, and help them get adopted. The second case is Lucy, who presented after being bitten by a snake and had severe tissue necrosis. Her owners and the RDVM wanted to speed up healing and reduce scarring, of course. You know, but this area over the back of the elbow is difficult to heal because of the constant motion. Initially, laser therapy was considered, but she already really had good granulation tissue, as you can see here, with minimal infection. And the goal was to enhance tissue healing, and it was felt that the loop would be more effective and more cost efficient and easier for the owners to give treatments at home rather than make several trips to the veterinary office every two days for weeks. The photo on the left shows Lucy's wounds when a CC loop treatments were started. This is about 30 days after the snake bite. The photo on the right shows Lucy's wounds just 21 days later, two treatments per day with the CC loop. It's about approximately 50% of its previous size and looks so much better. This is Myla. It's pretty, pretty dog. Myla is a six-year-old female German Shepherd dog owned by a dog trainer. Myla is a top German Shepherd dog in Canadian competitive obedience. What happened? Myla was injured while playing Frisbee, again, not even, you know, during uh, one of her runs. She landed flat on her back. Following that injury, she was unable to get up into the car. She could not get an appointment with Dr. David Lane, who's a famous rehabilitation vet in Canada. So the owner heard about the Assisi loop and used it every six hours while using massage, arnica, and rest. And within a few days, she was much better, even getting in to see Dr. David Lane and being diagnosed with a strained quadratus laborum. This is the picture of how easy it is to treat your patient at home. She looks pretty comfortable. This is Myla back to competing. And this is Myla winning after her injury, which is pretty cool. This is Millie. And here's where it gets kind of fun to use a loop when other times other modalities wouldn't be as successful. She's a seven-year-old female spade red fox Labrador who had an acute episode of osteoarthritis in two legs. Of course, her history includes two unsuccessful stifle surgeries. I mean, what a bummer. And she's non-steroidal intolerant, three GI bleeds. I mean, what do you do? Uh, her vet, Dr. Aaron Troy, the owner of Muller Vet and the Canine Rehab Center, prescribed the loop for Millie, and she hasn't looked back since. She used the loop for 10 days, and now the owner just uses it chronically and when it rains. So. Of course, Millie also received complementary modalities in recovery. You see her there with a the treadmill. I'm sure, she had the laser. But the beauty is this big dog getting into and out of a car and having the owner be able to treat at home. He looks pretty relaxed, taking care of her. And there is the happy Millie with Dr. Troy. 
So of course we always get the weird patients who always have uh, complicated histories. Here's Otis, black Labrador. He's no different. He's still adorable. He has a history of neuropathy. Bilateral total knee replacements. I mean, where do you go there? He was on steroids and pain medications. But with the ACC loop, his muscle wasting stopped and he was actually able to be tapered off all of his pain meds and he lives without any additional medications at this point, which is pretty remarkable. Here's Otis at home being treated. Again, looks pretty comfortable. Here's Blake. Blake, of course, a rescue dog, a 10-year-old Mount Castrate pit. He's diagnosed with chronic osteoarthritis, and of course, if you looked more like sort of pit um, facet, his arthritis in his many joints, and his has, he spent many years on supplements. He unfortunately had an episode of intervertebral disc disease and lived on Prevacox and acupuncture. Of course, um, his owner had much difficulty uh, with her finances. She was trying to move at the time that he had this um, episode of IVDD, and somebody suggested using the ACC loop. And since then, he has been weaned off of his Prevacox and has discontinued acupuncture. All he does is use the loop when he's symptomatic. And he's got a lot of symptoms. There he is in his Halloween costume, getting treated for his shoulder and his elbow. And you can see that putting it right there, you can penetrate four to five inches on each side, get both joints, which is great. This is when he had an ear infection. The owner just taped it to the inside of an e-collar, which is pretty creative. So this is a case I am really excited about. Um, sort of growing up, uh, my background is internal medicine and definitely a lot of the patients that come into my practice were definitely, definitely old, arthritic. Um, so I don't get a chance to treat a lot of neurologic cases. But this is a case where an owner owned an eight-year-old female spade Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. And she was diagnosed with caudal occipital malformation syndrome. They kind of get put into that hodgepodge of that area up there. And what happened is that <clears throat> she formed a syringohydromyelia. So let's just review a little bit about that because it helped us to really explain the pathogenesis <clears throat> and why the loop is effective. So Chiari type 1 malformations in people <clears throat> involve malformation of the caudal occipital bone, which overcrowds the caudal fossa. COMS, <clears throat> caudal occipital malformation syndrome, is a term used in veterinary medicine to describe a similar condition. Of course, the beloved Cavalier King Charles Spaniel is the most common breed affected, the first documented case in the 1990s. Overcrowding leads to the kinking of the brainstem and herniation of part of the cerebellum. These abnormalities cause obstructions to CSF flow through the subarachnoid space. The chronic CSF flow distortion leads to the formation of this fluid-filled cavity within the spinal cord known as syringohydromyelia. Clinical signs may be hydrocephalus, may be seizures. However, most of the clinical signs are attributable to the development of the syringohydromyelia. Medical therapy, which I use commonly and had patients referred to me when they're many, many years old and they come in with all these medications and have arthritis, they use medications to reduce the CSF production, decrease incitatory neurotransmitter release, provide pain relief, and reduce inflammation. C fibers, which transmit the nociceptive signals are activated by cellular damage in the dorsal horn as a result of the syringohydromyelia. As the syrinx enlarges, the ongoing activation leads to accumulation of glutamate and substance P, which are responsible for transmission of pain signals. This manifests as allodynia, where a non-noxious stimulus is perceived as painful or dysesthesia, which are spontaneous, unpleasant, abnormal sensations. Clinically in dogs, neuropathic pain appears as phantom scratching, poorly localized pain, fasciculations, excessive grooming. If it's more severe, the white matter involvement will lead to signs of ataxia. 
many dogs in my referral hospital were actually sent to the dermatologist for atopy because they were chronically scratching at their neck. So this is Madison, and we were able to get the owner to video Madison. This is Madison hanging out, and the owner is actually able to induce one of these scratching fits in her. Now, of course, Madison's owned by a veterinarian, so, you know, we already know. We're blessed with always having dogs like this. Madison has had these phantom scratching fits since she was a puppy, about four to six per day. Uh, her veterinarian was prompted by owning this dog to actually enroll in an integrative medicine program at the University of Tennessee because she was so frustrated by the lack of um, what she was learning outside to treat her own dog. So Madison had been on gabapentin and omeprazole, which really did help her for a while. She tried laser, of course, because everybody has one. Uh, she tried massage. She tried acupuncture. She tried spinal manipulation. However, nothing helped. And laser therapy and acupuncture actually made her worse. This dog could not tolerate needles. So every time the owner would have to increase the gabapentin if she had some type of um, acute exacerbation, which made her groggy. And we all know that's a side effect, although we love gabapentin. It's a great drug. So enter the Assisi loop. And here's Madison receiving treatment. She doesn't look bothered. She does one little sort of scratchy thing, um, but you can tell that she's really not bothered by what's going on. Um, her mom's like, oh, I don't know if this is really working. Is it working? Who knows? So what happened? Actually, within the first few leap treatment, loop treatments, within 24 to 36 hours, the owner could see positive results. Her paritic fits decreased down to two, less than two a day. And she couldn't even stimulate her to have these um, phantom scratching fits. And she really kind of likes her treatments. So here's Madison hanging out. Very easy. You know, one of the things when we talk about when we prescribe the loop is you know, kind of like that first, you know, when you're training your diabetic owner. Oh, my God, how am I going to remember to do this twice a day? It's going to change my lifestyle. And that's one of these things about the loop. Oh, my God, I have to sit there for 15 minutes. You know? The loop gets put on Madison, she chills out, she lays down, she enjoys it because she knows she kind of feels better when she's done. So this is her post-treatment. She's sleepy, she definitely doesn't look uncomfortable, she doesn't look gorked in any way. Um, and the owner has tried to actually induce a scratching fit and she can't get her to do it. And this is probably the third time the owner tried to get her to do it because we, she knew uh, that we would like to get some uh, evidence out of it. But the owner was really impressed. And still to date, she's on less gabapentin and has only received the loop as additional treatment. All right, so let's talk about hazelnut. She, of course, another complicated case, 15 years old, female spay domestic short hair, presented with two CVAs. One in the cervical neck region uh, in August and September of 2013. She was laterally recumbent. The MRI confirmed the strokes, and she started with physical rehabilitation only just to improve the ambulation. She responded well, regained ambulation with only mild residual neurological deficits. Unfortunately, a few months later, a third stroke at the cervical neck region confirmed again with an MRI. Mark torticollis, neurologic deficits in all four limbs, the left worse than the right, laterally recumbent, although this time she had cranial nerve deficits, corneal ulcer in the left eye because she couldn't blink. She had decreased sensation to her tongue. And I don't know if you treated one of these, but um, hers progressed to something not so good. The marked left head tilt, loss of sensation, and the tendency to have the tongue fall out of the mouth resulted in the patient continually biting herself. Um, so much so she didn't want to eat, in addition to the ulcer, add insult to injury. The patient was also noted to have a Schirmer test of zero in 60 seconds in the left. Also, the strokes caused partial loss of speech. While the patient was still able to growl and hiss, of course, that is Murphy's Law, she was unable to meow. So what did she do? She continued with weekly physical therapy, initiated for the ambulation, 
and she started the ACC loop. And again, being a busy veterinarian working in emergency practice, she either did it once or twice a day, placed around the neck, because in that area of placement, you could reach four to five inches on either side so she could treat the oral cavity while treating the neck. She had to syringe feed, apply antibiotic ointment and artificial tears to the eye. Here she is, two and a half months of therapy, now ambulatory, residual deficits. She still falls to the left about 15% of the time, but her left-sided head tilt, as you can see, has improved markedly, and the tongue injuries are fully healed. So she doesn't have the syringe feeder, and we all know how time-consuming that is. The CC loop therapy was decreased to every other day. The ulcer is healed, and her Shermer actually improved to seven seconds, so that's pretty cool. Finally, June 2014, the patient was noted to actually be able to meow for the first time in six months. Here's a story about Bob. Bob, we should nickname him Bitey Bob, had uh, needed bilateral MPL uh, repair. Of course, he was owned by a tech, and uh, which sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't. But you know, we always get these cases owned by technicians and members of your staff. So Bob's a three-year-old long-haired chihuahua. October 2013, he got bilateral, that's pretty brave, MPL surgery. Post-op rehab, he had e stem he had laser, therapeutic exercises, and an CC loop. Bob used the automatic version of the loop, which again, turns on every two hours for 15 minutes, and it just sort of laid on him uh, around the dressing, or in Bob's case, placed over the surgical site and moved as needed to stay in place. Bob is a land shark, by the way, not sure if I mentioned that. By day two, he was reluctant to walk, but would actually bear weight with support, which is pretty good, because a lot of these dogs, the owners have carried them around for months. Now, he being a special case with bilateral repair, you know, he definitely probably was carried around more, but he has not really used those back legs in a long time. The CC loop remained in place in automatic mode, and day two, no evidence of swelling or redness at the excision site, that's pretty cool. He continued with his e stem, his laser, and his manual therapy. Day three to seven, he continued to recover remarkably well. His rehab was actually limited to passive range of motion twice a day and the loop. Day five, discontinued his non steroidal, and he gradually increased his activity. One to two weeks following surgery, remarkable recovery, one of the best they've noted, fully weight bearing, no signs of any offloading to the front and he's actually walking about half the distance he was walking pre-surgery. Two weeks to present, he's done really well, gradually increased his walk to the full distance he was walking prior to any MPL issues, trotting with no discomfort, now back to normal activity with no restrictions. So where are we going next? Well, what I described in the first part was all of our, well, many of our studies in the human field but we are partnering with institutions for research. So currently, what's on our plate? We are doing a post-operative hemileminectomy study with an institution currently. We are about to embark on two exciting studies. One is a chronic osteoarthritis study, which we will use um, force plate analysis and client-specific outcome measures to gauge progress. And secondly, very exciting, a post-operative TPLO study. The jury's kind of out depending on who you talk to about, you know, do we really need something in this market? But um, I think if surgeons would be really happy to tell their owners that following, you know, instead of, four, instead of eight weeks or 12 weeks of keeping these big dogs restricted for activity, that maybe after four to six weeks they didn't have to do that. So the current study we have devised is actually going to measure bone healing and client-specific outcome measures and force plate analysis. So that's really exciting. We're also going to work with a neurologist um, who does a lot of grant writing for the Canon Health Foundation um, in a different mechanism about uh, hemilaminectomy repair, maybe sort of pre-op, post-op, no-op situation. Equines. Um, a little bit harder to actually get a case-based population, but they're definitely on our horizon. Um, 
And how are we going to do that? Again, one of the biggest drawbacks to the loop is does the owner actually have to hold it onto a dog hip, uh, onto a dog knee, et cetera. So we are coming out with a line of wearables, wraps, and beds. So definitely stay tuned. There is our information. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to go to our website. We have a lot of the FDA white papers that were used in people and also some other PMF, not our signal specifically, but there's a very good chronic OA PMF paper out of Illinois. There is a PMF study out of Italy on um, benign prosthetic hyperplasia on there. And if you want any of these papers emailed to you, don't hesitate to um, email on the bottom or call.